Hello, I'm Dr. Paula Rosen. I'm the publisher of Education Update, and it's a great honor to be here in New York City at Hunter College with President Jennifer Rabb, who is the 13th president of one of the oldest colleges in this country. Thank you for spending some time with us today, President Rabb. Dr. Rosen, is always wonderful to talk to you and to um, talk to the readers of Education Update, of which I am a very loyal, devoted fan. Thank you. That's a great compliment. So you have been such a powerful force at the helm of this college. You've accomplished an incredible number of things. And one of the things I want to mention, the motto of the college, which you personify, <laughs> Mihi Kura Futuri, the care of the future is mine. And one of the th ways in which you've demonstrated this is that you open the doors of Hunter College to the victims and the homeless of, from Hurricane Sandy here at this college. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Hurricane Sandy was quite a challenge for us at Hunter College. Um, we had committed to the city that we would house a shelter for those displaced from the storm. So we had about 200 people in our gymnasium. We served meals. We had many visitors from the city who wanted to work with the people and help support them. And we either set, even set up a, an animal shelter, although I don't think any animals came. Um, but the big uh, challenge for us was at the same time, one of our campuses, our renowned nursing school, which is on 26th Street and 1st Avenue, was totally flooded by Sandy. So overnight, um, we had been prepared, but just as we had been prepared in other storms uh, for you know, the impact, we realized that this storm was way more severe than expected. We lost all of the facilities on the campus. So the Amazing. entire nursing school, our medical lab programs, our physical therapy programs had to be relocated. And within hours, we were making plans to relocate over 160 classes a week. So every inch of Hunter College was on our main campus was taken by hurricane victims either from the Brookdale campus or from homeless in the city. And then we had 600 students who were in our Brookdale dorms. And we were able to find emergency housing for um, probably about 100 of them over the, the couple of months that we were out of Brookdale. And then to try to support and communicate with those students who had lost their dorm rooms. In addition, we had faculty and we had staff who also lost their homes or also had great damage. And we were very proud. We raised about $100,000 to support our own students and then some emergency loans and grants to our faculty and staff who were also displaced or who had great damage and real financial need. So it, it really was, as you said, this way that we showed, as we really do every day, that the care of the future really is ours. Well, I'm sure that those individuals will never forget the time that they spent here at Hunter uh, during the, you know, and after Sandy, just as the Coopermans <laughs> never forgot their time here uh, at Hunter. Indeed, the Cooperman family just recently donated one of the largest gifts in the history of CUNY, $25 million, to Hunter College. And just because they met and married here doesn't <laughs> really do it. I think it had something to do with the entire college and what... Uh, and what they gleaned and gained from their education here. So tell us a little bit about the new library, which is fabulous. I've been Thank in there you. and I was overwhelmed and, uh, and their wonderful gift. So start with this wonderful couple, the Coopermans. Uh, they did meet in our Bronx campus. They met in French class. So I guess that's very romantic. Um, <laughs> and they both remember when Hunter College was $24 a semester. And I think that's where they got the $25 million idea from. Uh, she was the president of the student government, and he was the vice president. He likes to remind us of that. Uh, he went on to become a very successful businessman. But when I met him, um, I asked him what his hunter story was. And I always find, Paula, that there's, you know, for people who have gone through the hunter um, experience here, that they have something special that happened to them here that made him, them who they are today. So I asked Lee to tell me a little bit about his background and what Hunter had meant to him. He told me a wonderful story. He was a kid from the Bronx. His father was a plumber, chemistry major, physics minor. And he got through Hunter in three years because he was so smart and was accepted into University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And he got the last seat there. He took the last scholarship. 
And then he went to his very poor parents and said, I need money to buy dental instruments to practice on, and I have to engrave them with my initials. Well, within two weeks of his time at the University of Pennsylvania Dental School, Lee decided this really wasn't for him. So you can imagine the disappointed people at Penn who had given him the last scholarship and the last seat, and his rather upset parents who had spent their last money on these dental instruments. Who took him back? It was the Hunter Dean at the time. Oh. And the Hunter Dean said, you're an extraordinary student. Perhaps you made a, you know, a wrong, you might have made a wrong career choice. Come back to us. What do you want to learn? You finished all your requirements. You went through very quickly. You know, I was always interested in economics and business, he said. So he took a semester full of economics courses and then a second semester of economics courses, graduated, and went on to incredible success in business. So it was a amazing, wonderful amazing memory story. of what of all the things Hunter did for him. But this gift was very important to us in so many ways. First of all, it's quite a model for other Hunter alums and for many in the city of what it, you can do to support a public college. So he really wanted to make a statement of, of leadership in this gift that others should follow. The other message of the gift was that Lee Cooperman is one of the world's best value investors. He will buy a stock low because he thinks it's going to go up. So when Lee Cooperman says, Hunter, you're a great investment, that is very meaningful <laughs> of the power of our success. And then the third thing, which is very, very important, is that philanthropy is something that we all have to learn. And some cultures and some households yes. are more attuned. So Lee has now, and Toby, have sent this message to our students that you have to pay it forward, that you need to know what Hunter is giving you. And when you can, in whatever way you can, you need to give back as well. So we know there's another Lee Cooperman in the library studying today. And this gift will, each time they go into the Cooperman Library, say to them, when you make it, you have to give back as well. It's a wonderful yeah. message. Yeah. It really is a wonderful message. Right. I would go into the library and say, will the, will the next Cooperman please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> and I hope, I hope you will. Um, but I, you asked a little bit about the library, and I think it's a wonderful um, you know, conversation to have these days because so many people think, well, libraries must be passe. And even when I was speaking with Mr. and Mrs. Cooperman, when we, I asked them for this support, they also raised that question because we all know that so much of our material is now online. And the truth is that the most checked out item in the Hunter Library are laptops. Um, students are coming in, they don't have laptops at home or they don't have the quality. They want to come and study on the laptops they can use with us. And they're accessing books, they're accessing, accessing all sorts of websites and databases. And it's not that traditional go to the stacks and pull off a book. But the demand for library is increasing. We are commuter school, so the students are caught between the subways and the buses, and then almost all of our students are working, so they're going on to work. What a library does is says, this is a place where you can study. This is where we respect you as a student. We've invested in you as a student, as a researcher, as a scholar, as a future leader, and we're going to provide a wonderful, quiet, supportive environment for you to do your work. It's also not your mother's library. Libraries today are really student success centers. So we are moving into our library, all of our tutoring centers, our writing center, our math support, our science learning centers, to help students really reach their potential. We're moving our pre -prof professional programs into the library. So we have a wonderful program for pre-law, for pre-med, and for pre-business, which Mr. Koopman also helped us start. So the library is being reimagined, but for a commuter school to have this center that values a student for their real commitment to their work, nothing could be really more important. I couldn't agree more, and it's a remarkable place. I've been it, and I've seen it for myself. Uh, there's another person that also feels gratitude <laughs> to Hunter, and I was with him this morning, and his name is Stephen Freeman. He is the CEO of an organization that helps thousands of people who are developmentally uh, handicapped. 
And he is so grateful to Hunter because he got his social work degree. Yes, he did. Which brings me to where the social work school now is, up in Harlem doing wonderful things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think Steve really also personifies that Hunter mission, and we were very proud a few years back to induct him into our Hunter Hall of Fame as just one of the hundreds of social work alums that are really doing so much for the needy in New York City. It's truly incredible. But we had a dream with our School of Social Work. Um, it came also out of a story, of a great philanthropic story. Buddy Silberman was one of the great um, New Yorkers who believed in also in giving back. And he actually bought the townhouse um, next to him on 79th Street and tore down that townhouse and his own and built us the School of Social Work on 79th Street that opened in 1970. We began to outgrow it and we also felt that it would be really important for the Hunter social workers to be in a neighborhood where they could really make a hands-on difference. So through a very complicated and interesting real estate swap where Dan Brodsky, a wonderful New York City developer, built us that wonderful new building on 119th Street and 3rd Avenue that houses the Silverman School of Social Work, the Hunter School of Public Health, our Brookdale Center on Aging, and our Centro um, Archives of Puerto Rican Studies. We were able to bring all of that into the, into the East Harlem neighborhood when Mr. Brodsky finished that building for us. And then he was allowed to take the 79th Street site and turn it into um, a wonderful residential product, uh, uh, project. So both sides have really benefited. The deal won real estate deal of the year. So we were proud of that because it was a very creative way for a university to have a public-private partnership. The result is just flourishing. Our social work school has been growing both in numbers and in rankings. We train people to work both with individuals, with groups, to do organizing in communities, and our outreach has spread all through the East Harlem area. But most importantly, we're really partnering with our School of, social, of Public Health, which is there, and bringing in our education school and our nursing school. And we have a very clear mission that I've charged all of these schools with. How does a school of like Hunter come into an underserved neighborhood and make sure that we are helping this neighborhood in a decade or so become healthier, become better educated, and become more socially secure? That is our mission, and that will be how we measure ourselves. We must add value in the neighborhood as we train the next generation of caring professionals. There can't be a higher mission than that. And I must say that you know you you uh, spoke in a in a way about this real estate deal. Mm -hmm. I know uh, from what I've heard and what I've seen mm -hmm. and what you've mentioned to me that was an incredibly astute thing to do. And you engineered this. You did it. I have a certain passion for real estate, and I can I tell you about our most recent deal, please. <laughs> um, so for a very long time, actually since I began twelve years ago. The thing that the faculty was most really um, in need of and was on the top of the Hunter wish list was a new science facility. We have one of the most extraordinary missions in science because we do incredible research, particularly for a public college. We have more NIH funding than any school in New York State without a medical school. And we do it in a really important way because the diversity of our scientists, the fact that our biology department is about a third women and a third underrepresented minority scientists, means that not only do we have brilliant scientists that produce great research, but they are also extraordinary role models. So we, are, we have that STEM pipeline that everyone is talking about, the need for to have more women and more minorities in science. We are doing that at Hunter College. We are number two in our classification in this country for women getting doctorates, and number nine for African American students going on to get PhDs. That is truly extraordinary. But we had a challenge. The granting agencies would come in and say, brilliant faculty, brilliant proposals, wonderful students, but your facilities, you know, maybe a C minus D. We were working in a 1939 building, which has just proven really difficult to renovate to the standards of modern science. 
we didn't have enough space, and the space we had was low quality. So we had to find a place to build. We are in one of the most expensive neighborhoods where there's very little available real estate, and we didn't want to send our science off of the site you know, so there was another neighborhood so that we would lose their ability to really you know, excite students about science. That would be a mistake. So how do you find some place to build in the, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan? It just, the solution was that we've done another kind of swap where we've um, given the city our downtown campus for nursing in order for them to build a new sanitation garage. And they have given us the site of the sanitation garage on 74th Street and the East River to build with Memorial Sloan Kettering an incredible complex of healthcare delivery, of science research, and of education and learning. So our science researchers will go into that new building and our, new, our nurses and physical therapists as will as well. So for Hunter to be such a critical part now, the East Side Corridor for healthcare delivery and for science research, to celebrate our partnership with Weill Cornell and with Memorial Sloan Kettering is just an incredible thing. And I feel as a legacy to have been able to make these partnerships will be something that really has helped me move that motto forward well, about the future. Cornell Weill and Sloan Kettering, you can't get better partners than that. Sure in science and in research, and in caring, in caring. and, and, and uh, solving problems. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, incidentally, talk about medicine. You've had two women who are Nobel laureates. We are the only school, Hunter. only school in the world to have two women Nobel Prize winners in medicine. And I know there's a third in this building, Paula. <laughs> Stand up, please. Um, I know I interviewed Rosalind Yallow. I haven't wow. ever spoken with. Um, uh, Gertrude Elliot. Mm -hmm. So that's something to, to do. Um, I wanted to talk too about um, the fact that you are have been cited as one of the 50 most powerful women <laughs> in New York City. How does that make you feel? Do you uh, eat your Wheaties in the morning? <laughs> to say it, it does. It, it it's nice to read that, um, but when you go home, you know that um, it's probably. Uh, what's written on the paper, but not the reality. I remember when I was first appointed, uh, the phone rang, and my daughter was about seven then, and she looked at the receiver and she said, President Rab, ha! <laughs> 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 so I think you always have to remember that. <laughs> so I'd like to um, finish with yet another unbelievable thing that you did, in the, not in the field of science, but in the field of art. You now have the Tribeca Art Gallery and none other than the great-grandson of Camille Pissarro is the head of that, Joaquin Pissarro. You're everywhere. <laughs> Art, science, music, theater, Danny Kay Playhouse. So what is left to do? Uh, I think the next, gener next uh, focus really has to be to continue to invest in our students so they can take advantage of these amazing facilities for the arts. Um, we also didn't get to talk about Roosevelt House, where our public policy and human rights programs are flourishing. So there is so much now that we have for our students. The challenge is, since so many students are from families where they're first generation college students, often English is a second language. They're commuting. They're working. How do we make sure that Hunter does all it can do to serve this student body, to invest in them, get them this great education, and help them graduate to go on to be great successes in this world. There's one other legacy that I wanted to ask you about, President Rabb, and that has to do with another great name in history yes. and politics, and it's President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his wife, and of course his mother. <laughs> Sarah, how could we ever leave Sarah out no. of the formula? <laughs> and they had Roosevelt House, which was just a few blocks away from Hunter. And tell us a little bit about what happened to Roosevelt House and, and then where it is today, because it's fabulous, just fabulous. It's a wonderful story in history. Franklin and Eleanor get married, and Sarah, Franklin's mom, had some reservations about Eleanor to begin with, bought them and built them, actually, a new home for their wedding present in 1908. But there's one stipulation. She kept half of it for herself. We like to keep call that the first new deal. 
<laughs> they moved in, and that's where they had their children, five children, and they moved to Albany, they moved to Washington, but Sarah always lived in the home, so they would come back, and it really was part, very much the place of their early marriage. It becomes very important in history in 1921. Why? Because that's, of course, when Franklin um, comes down with polio and is paralyzed. And the house had an elevator, which is very unusual for that time, and he could find a measure of independence in the home. He built himself a hand-operated wheelchair, and he navigated the house, and that's where he put back his political camp career. He ran from gov for governor in 1928, when he lived in the house, and perhaps most importantly and most compelling, in 1932, that's where he, he plans his presidential campaign, comes home from the Biltmore Hotel to find his mom, Sarah, on the stairs, meeting him as the president-elect president and saying, this is the happiest day of my life. For those history buffs know that the inauguration in those days was not until 1933. So from November to March uh, the, of 1933, the New Deal was planned in this house. And this is where Eleanor said to Franklin, you should really have a woman cabinet secretary. And Frances Perkins writes in her memoir about being invited to the house and talks about how it was a little bit disorganized because Eleanor was never the best housekeeper, but how Franklin made her the offer to be the first woman cabinet secretary. And she says, you know, she will do it, but only if he creates a social safety net for this country, which ultimately becomes Social Security. Hunter winds up buying the house in 1943 after the Roosevelts have moved to the White House because Eleanor and the Hunter students developed this relationship when they lived there. We don't know exactly how, but we assume that just sometimes Eleanor probably had to get out of the house and away from her mother-in-law. <laughs> but they loved Hunter, and they said to the Hunter community, buy the house, $50,000, a great price at that time, and the Roosevelts donated the first $1,000 towards the purchase. Hunter used it as an interfaith center, which was really FDR and Eleanor's view vision. We had the Hillel, we had the Newman Society, and many other clubs. And we really used it until we could use it no more. It fell into terrible disrepair and by 1990 had to be closed. I knew about the house from my former days working in preservation and when I came to Hunter I was committed to find a way to open the house, restore it, and turn it into a public policy institute for the college. And it is so gratifying today to see the faculty working on research there but perhaps even more to see the students engaged in two incredible programs, one in public policy and one in human rights in the honor of Franklin and Eleanor, and then to have all sorts of wonderful programs for our students and our community. So everyone from Bill Gates to Bill Clinton to Ban Ki-moon has have spoken in the house and engaged with our students. So what an inspiration to be able to tell the students they are in the home of some of the most important social justice leaders that our country has ever seen, and to meet these incredible leaders of today, to inspire them to live that Hunter motto about being responsible for the care of the future. What a wonderful note to end on, and I congratulate you on bringing together so many different communities of people, of endeavors, of academic disciplines, and just Fabulous, just fabulous. I just uh, want to say how much I am one of your admirers. <laughs> well, thank a, you for all you do. It is an incredible privilege to be in this position where you're looking at the next generation and seeing how you can contribute to making them the leaders that our city and our country will definitely need. So I thank you, Paula. And it's wonderful to have Education Update always telling the story of the great things going on in education because we hear too many stories about you know what we're not doing right and you are always talking about the things where people are making a difference and we all appreciate that thank you very much